All right, uh, we'll start, even though it's, we've got a minute left. Um, no longer can you escape. Uh, what the heck is Kubernetes is the name of the session today. Thanks for joining me. Um, or, how I thought of it while I was planning it, Kubernetes, a picture book. Um, they say that when you're a beginner, it can be helpful to have another beginner explain things to you because they will cover the more basic things that advanced practitioners might gloss over or take for granted. So consider this a sort of intro from maybe like a level one beginner to a level zero beginner. I don't know. We'll, we'll assess at the end. Uh, who am I? I'm Brie Benish. I have a background in Drupal development and tech leadership in an agency setting. Um, I'm also a solutions architect at Amazee.io, meaning I help match organizations and application developers up with the appropriate hosting products and services uh, from our company, and then I help their app get their apps running up on our platform. Um, I've been about at Amazee for about nine months now, so we're going to see you know, how much I learned in that nine months from all the incredibly smart people around me. Um, why this talk? Actually, it was inspired. I was at a Shabbat dinner, and a rabbi asked me what I do for a living, because that's the first question you get asked in this area all the time. And I said, Kubernetes-based container, container hosting, and he looked at me like I had an ear growing out of my forehead, <laughs> which is a reasonable response, I think. Um, <laughs> and you know, he asked me questions. We went back and forth. I did my best to explain. But at the end, I didn't feel satisfied right? that, I, that I'd done the best job I could. And I'm somebody who really believes that like anybody can understand technology. We just have to do a really good job of explaining it. And so obviously, I had not <laughs> done a really good job of explaining it. Otherwise, we'd be able to hire Rabbi Teitelbaum, I think. So, um, so I thought to myself, you know, I should learn how to explain this better. And thus began a sort of ongoing imaginary conversation in my head for months um, with an imaginary audience, which is now you. So congratulations. Um, so this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about what Kubernetes is. Um, we're going to cover what are some of the cool features, especially those that could benefit you. Um, we'll also talk about what are some of the challenges with using Kubernetes. And then we'll cover how do you get yourself some Kubernetes. And yeah, that's it. Um, and we'll end with a, with a couple of resources. So let's dig in. Um, I have notes for myself, Q2001, a space odyssey theme. Bum, 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 <laughs> bum, bum. And then just imagine the chaos Elmo right here. Uh, Kubernetes. Um, so when you hear this word bounced around, do you feel a little bit like Indigo Montoya in The Princess Bride? <laughs> I keep using this word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Um, so what is Kubernetes? It's an open source container orchestration platform. Simple, right? Presentation done, let's go home. The day is over. Um, right, kidding. The first time someone said that to me, my reaction was, okay, those are certainly all words. <laughs> uh, so let's take a step back to really understand what Kubernetes is and the role it plays. We need to sort of take a look backwards. In traditional hosting, you'd have maybe a sysadmin managing a server. Your sysadmin would install something like Apache on the machine and then install other tools like PHP, MySQL, anything that your applications might need to run on the server. And then you or your sysadmin, depending on roles and responsibilities, would deploy your application into the server. First using FTP, but hopefully we've all left that behind. I know that everyone has, so I've talked to them. Um, and then with using version control tools like Git, right? So I think this is something common ground we, we, all, we all know. So you could theoretically support different types of applications on the same server, as long as the operating system and the infrastructure supported the technology um, required by those applications. But often, I mean, in my, in my experience, I don't know about yours, I find that if we're running, say, like Drupal or .NET, we'd find those on completely different servers um, and just set things up completely separately rather than deal with the hassle of supporting them together. Now, there are some familiar challenges here. Um, a server's resources, like the CPU, the memory, the storage, they're all shared among the multiple applications and the services on that server. So if the multiple applications on the server experience high traffic or resource demand simultaneously, there could be resource contention leading to performance issues, which are not fun. Um, applications might also have conflicting dependencies or runtime requirements, which could complicate your server management. And security concerns exist, since vulnerabilities in one application could potentially affect others on the same server. Um, after a long era of traditional hosting, we started to see the rise of containers. A container is a lightweight and standalone executable package 
that includes everything you need to run an application. So containers provide a consistent and reproducible environment for running your application, regardless of the underlying infrastructure. So the app that you run locally is going to be exactly the same as the app that you run on dev and the app that you run on production. It has all the same underlying tools and services in whatever environment you put it in. So you sort of hopefully don't run into this. It works on my machine. Why does it suddenly not deploy correctly to dev? Oh my god, PHP is a completely different version, right? That's not going to happen because it's inside your container and your container moves with your application. So as I said, with containerization, each application can run on its own container with its specific dependencies and its configurations. But despite the benefits, we still have challenges here. Um, we often have to manually scale these containers to accommodate either changes in traffic or resource demands. And this involves monitoring the application, manually monitoring it, and deciding whether to add or remove containers, which can be time consuming or error prone. And this is where Kubernetes enters the picture. Well, first, let's say, where did it come from? It was originally developed by Google. I'm not, I don't know if that's surprising. It feels like everything is touched by Google these days. Um, Google developed an internal container orchestration system that they named Borg. If you're not familiar with the Borg, it's a Star Trek reference. They are a cybernetic hive mind alien race that assimilates other beings into their collective. You can Google for more fun. Um, Google developed Borg as a system that could self-heal, it could scale, and it could automate resource utilization all while running on off-the-shelf hardware. It's pretty cool. Um, Borg is the foundation for Kubernetes. Um, Borg used, um, Google used Borg as an internal tool for over a decade. Um, and then in 2014, they released Kubernetes as an open source project. So the word Kubernetes, which is a much less ominous <laughs> moniker, um, has its origins in Greek, roughly translating to helmsman or pilot. Don't leave people alone at midnight. They'll insert movie references. Um, thanks, Gus. Um, so Kubernetes, was, the word was chosen because um, it's the captain of the containerized, containerized applications on the cluster. It's guiding their deployment, their scaling, and their management within that cluster. Which is why the Kubernetes logo is a helm or a ship's wheel. And you'll often see it abbreviated as K8S, the eight standing for the number of letters between K and S because we don't like typing. There you go. Okay. This is stick figure drawing applied to Kubernetes architecture, all right? So let's introduce some basic concepts. We're gonna talk about clusters, nodes, and pods. Kubernetes exists as a cluster, and a cluster is made up of compute machines called nodes. Sorry, I have to actually click the slide for it to do stuff. These nodes are basically our worker machines where our containerized applications are gonna run. The nodes are supervised by something called a control plane, which monitors and manages the entire cluster. Now each node contains pods. Pods are the smallest deployable units in Kubernetes, and they are composed of one or more containers. So they're going to house the containers that run our applications, right? And then I'll introduce one other little thing. It's called a namespace. So a namespace in Kubernetes is a logical partition within the cluster that provides a way to create isolation between different applications that share the same Kubernetes cluster. So resources like pods, services, persistent <coughs> volumes, they can be grouped into a namespace, and then all the resources within this namespace can easily communicate with each other, but they're isolated from the <coughs> other resources in the other namespaces. So everything that exists inside this namespace for your application is available to your application, but is not available to anything else running on that cluster. So for an application, you're usually going to need multiple pods. And like I said, each pod is going to be running one or more containers. You can see my super simple application examples up here. They've all got pods, and each pod mostly has one container in it, but a Drupal app has one pod that's running Nginx and PHP at the same time. So sometimes there's a one-to-one, -one, often there's a one-to-one, -one, but not always. Um, pods for an application may all be located on the same node, like you see in my JS app up here or they could be spread out across multiple nodes on the cluster. And this is something that's automatically managed by Kubernetes as it scales up and down in response to resource requirements. So generally, it's automatic. 
I think there is some level of control that you could have over this, uh, but that's that goes deeper than I'm going to go today. Um, all right. So with some of these really basic comments and terminal uh, concepts and terminology covered, let's talk about some of the cool features of Kubernetes. This is obviously a non-comprehensive overview, but we're going to take a look at some of the things that I think are of most interest and benefit to like application developers, people who host websites, product owners. First of all, it's open source. Um, preaching to the choir here, I really don't need to hammer this home, the benefits of open source, but I will just, you know, as a good open source person, will say, you know, the community contribution is huge. The contributions from a diverse and global community of not only developers, but users and organizations lead to continuous improvements and robust feature sets in, in a really rich platform. This collaboration also fosters innovation. So we have developers and organizations experimenting with and extending Kubernetes to meet their specific needs, and this can get contributed back and leads to the development of not only novel solutions, but best practices that we all share. It becomes more cost effective. I say more cost effective. We all know that this is relative, but since there are no licensing fees, you know, it can reduce the cost of adopting container orchestration and automation. Um, Kubernetes is governed by an organization called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which promotes vendor neutrality, and it ensures that no single entity is in control of Kubernetes. So then there's no single organization or person who has control <coughs> over this project. Um, the neutrality ensures fairness, it prevents vendor lock-in, and it promotes healthy competition in our ecosystem. These are all things that we're already familiar with from Drupal. And last but not least, security. We all know that open, air, open source software can come under rigorous security audits. The code base is available for anybody to look at. Security experts can look at it, they can bang against it, and also it leads to early detection and resolution of vulnerabilities. So all good things we're already aware of, just preaching to the choir, as I said. Compatibility. Um, so Kubernetes works on all kinds of different infrastructure. It's supported by all the major hyperscalers and infrastructure providers. So you can have your choice of vendors when you want to use it. AWS, GCP, Azure, when I say Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Provider, Azure. You could host on-premise. You could put it on service in your basement. You could have it on Raspberry Pis on your desk. It's a real life example. Um, and through containerization, Kubernetes can host most modern applications. If you can containerize it, you can run it on Kubernetes. And the logos that you see here on the screen are just a small slice of what's possible. Auto scaling. So, auto scaling. I like to think, this is my personal metaphor, so blame me if it doesn't work. I like to think of it like water settling across multiple fish tanks, right? Let's say that we have a cluster, but the nodes are fish tanks and the pods are happy little fish. So here we have our one happy little fish tank. It's not too full. But then maybe our traffic starts to spike and our resource usage needs to go up. So Kubernetes automatically scales up our resource allocation and the number of pods to handle this traffic spike. But our tank, our node, is getting pretty full. If Kubernetes is on a hyperscaler like AWS, Google, or Azure, they can work together to not only increase the number of pods available, but also to add new nodes to increase, to, to meet the increased demand. So remember, those new nodes are those compute machines where we're able to add compute machines. This is made possible because Kubernetes has an API through which hyperscalers can extend Kubernetes and respond to events like increased traffic or increased resource demand by spinning up a new node and then registering it to the cluster automatically so Kubernetes becomes aware of it, that it has extra space to grow into. Now, you might assume that the way this would work is that the first fish tank would stay full and then we'd slowly start filling up the new fish tank, right? But no. Kubernetes is actually smarter than that. Instead, it will spread things out across the available nodes. And it will keep doing that. It'll keep dynamically scaling up as resource usage requires. And then as things calm down, it'll automatically scale back down. Now this is a really handy thing, especially for your bottom line, right? Well, first of all, it's gonna automatically respond and automatically give you more resources as you need it. So instead of your application just hitting a wall and falling down flat, 
It's going to stay up, it's going to respond, it's going to scale automatically. But it doesn't just stay at this max point thinking, oh, I should hang out here because we got this big, we're going to need to stay this big. It's going to scale back down automatically, which means you're not going to be paying for all these resources that you're not actually using at the time. So it's really pretty handy. Um, if you're not on a hyperscaler, though, so you can, you can host Kubernetes, you can put Kubernetes on not a hyperscaler. Say you're running something like three Raspberry Pis stacked on your desk. Um, there's not really an option to automatically add another node, right? In this case, Kubernetes is going to stay within that static number of nodes, so three, three Raspberry Pis, and it's just going to flex the number of pods up and down. Um, in order to add another node, you'd have to like run to the store, buy a Raspberry Pi, add it to the stack. It's like super manually growing it. <laughs> And then it's not going to scale back down unless you take them off. Um, I mean, the number of nodes. Anyway, that's the end of my fish tank metaphor. Um, so let's talk about some of the features that make Kubernetes very resilient. Um, so first, auto-healing. In the context of Kubernetes, auto-healing refers to the ability of the system to automatically detect and recover from failures without manual intervention. <laughs> so first, we'll talk about auto-healing on the node level. So here we have our happy little Kubernetes cluster with our nodes and our pods and our control plane. <clears throat> our control plane is always actively monitoring the health of the nodes in the cluster. Here inside my weird mind, this is like the eye of Sauron just watching everything. Um, <laughs> if, if a node becomes unresponsive or experiences hardware or software issues, Kubernetes is going to detect that and consider it failed. When a node failure is detected, the cluster's node auto-healing mechanism is going to take action and it's going to replace that failed node automatically. Then once the new node is ready, Kubernetes is going to automatic automatically either migrate the existing pods from the failed node or it's going to start new pods. And those migrated or new pods, they can be placed either on the new node that it spun up or on other available healthy nodes. This is um, this automatic migration and creation of pods ensures that our application workloads aren't disrupted even though we had a node failure. So something went wrong, it died, Kubernetes had to spin it up, but because it maintained as many of those pods as it could, our application is hopefully unscathed and keeps, keeps running. Let's talk about auto-healing on the pod level. So Kubernetes allows you to define health checks for pods. And these health checks will periodically probe the pods, so just poke them, um, to test that they're alive and that they're responsive. If a pod's health check fails, I hope you're enjoying all my emojis, um, <laughs> if it becomes unresponsive, Kubernetes is automatically going to restart that pod. So again, we have that resiliency happening. It's monitoring and it's reacting and it's, and it's bringing things back to life, basically. Let's talk about another feature that brings resiliency. This one's called replica sets. Kubernetes uses replica sets to maintain a specified number of pod replicas. Um, so let's say I configure my application to always have two sets of the necessary pods running. Right, so there's always a backup in case something goes wrong. If the number of replicas falls below what I specified, maybe it's because of a pod failure or some kind of node issue, the replica set controller is going to automatically create new pods to restore things to my desired state. I always want two running at the same time, it's going to make sure that that's happening. And then sort of the last feature I'll touch on here um, that I'll introduce here are called deployments. It can be a little bit confusing when we have duplicative or redundant, like repeated terminology that means different things. In Kubernetes, a deployment is a resource that you define with a configuration file. So in this configuration file, you're going to describe your application's desired state. You're going to say, like, how, how many replicas do I want running? Uh, what container image am I going to use? And configurations like that. And then Kubernetes is going to take those directions and manage the process of, uh, process of deploying your application to, to, meet, to meet what you outlined in your configuration file. So for our example Drupal app that you keep seeing in my slides, we tell Kubernetes that we need things like PHP and Nginx, Solar, Redis, that kind of stuff. And we tell it we always want two versions of our pods running at all times. And Kubernetes will deploy that for us as specified. When we need a deployment to update our existing app, Kubernetes is going to perform what's, what is called a rolling update. Now, a rolling update means it's going to gradually replace the old pods with new ones. It's going to spin up the new pod and ensure that it's healthy before shutting down the old pod. 
This ensures, again, that our application remains available even though we're updating it. <clears throat> Deployments also support something called cascading updates. And this simply means that we're going to automatically propagate out those changes to our replica sets as well, so that our entire application is updated consistently, not just, not just maybe the one set of pods. And last but not least, deployments also maintain a revision history of all your updates. So the revision history allows you to roll back to a previous known good state if an update has issues. So I think that was a lot. You can tell me, but let's put it all together. Um, so now with this context, perhaps container orchestration, words, wordy words, start to make a little bit more sense. Instead of needing to manually manage and monitor containers and the resources that they need to operate, we can have Kubernetes handle a lot of this. Think of Kubernetes as the conductor of an orchestra, right? It's setting the tempo, it's increasing and decreasing the volume or intensity of various sections, right? But instead of instruments and a musical score, Kubernetes is monitoring things like resource usage, allocating CPU to containers appropriately, and scaling the cluster up and down. Literally, Kubernetes is orchestrating the management of clusters running our applications. If we review all the stuff that I just said, it is monitoring the health of pods running our applications and the nodes hosting those pods. It's adjusting resource usage based on demand and automatically scaling both pods and nodes up and down as needed. It's reacting when pods or nodes fail and automatically restarting them. It's creating replicas of our necessary pods and running those as failovers. And it's deploying out changes in a rolling fashion, which ensures that our application remains available during our updates. But this is really only scratching the surface of Kubernetes. Really, it's really only like the first couple pages of docs. Um, but you can see why it might be touted for its scalability, its resiliency, and its flexibility. So if we time travel back to our first slide, Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform. Knowing what we know now, this sentence actually starts to make sense, I hope, if I've done my job well. I'd argue we still might not label it simple, um, but we at least now have the context to understand on a basic level what Kubernetes does, why and how it might benefit us as well as application developers, as product owners, as organizations with websites that need hosting. Now let's talk about challenges. Like Kubernetes is cool, but it's not all fun and games. The, the biggest challenge is that Kubernetes is hard. You need experts to run it. Um, they have to have cloud computing expertise and specific <coughs> Kubernetes expertise. You need certified Kubernetes administrators. Um, these people are in high demand and really low supply. So it's difficult to staff up and it's expensive to build and maintain your own team. And then there's often still a gap between the infrastructure and the day-to-day -day operation of deploying applications into Kubernetes. It can be very challenging for application developers to deploy their applications into Kubernetes because it requires them to learn a lot about Kubernetes to do so. And that can be really time consuming, frustrating for them, and it just pulls them away from what their actual job is, which is building and maintaining applications. So how do you get in on the Kubernetes action? You might not like this answer, but you need a team. You need your team or someone else's, right? You can build up an internal team, you can hire your own platform engineers, or you can hire an external team. Maybe you find a hosting company, it's an all-in service, they take care of everything for you. Maybe you have your own infrastructure, or you hire some kind of vendor that has cloud and Kubernetes expertise to run it within your own infrastructure. Um, but even still, there's gonna be this large gap between your platform and your application developers. Um, Either your platform engineers have to spend a lot of time supporting your application developers and being deeply involved in the day-to-day -day deployment operations, or your application developers have to learn Kubernetes and spend a lot of time in day-to-day -day deployment operations. It's not an easy answer. Um, one thing that I will leave you with, and I don't, don't want to plug this too hard, but I want to recommend a tool called um, that you may or may not have heard of called Lagoon. It's open source, um, much like the origin story of Kubernetes. Lagoon was originally built by Amazi.io as an internal tool, but they open sourced it in 2017. And now it has quite a few external contributors. Lagoon sits as a translation layer between the application and Kubernetes. And it basically transforms the needs of your application into directives for Kubernetes and automates the deployment of your applications into Kubernetes. It closes that gap that I mentioned, and it allows developers to benefit from all the cool features of Kubernetes and our websites to benefit from it without the hassle of having to learn all the ins and outs. 
Um, with a simple code push, your devs can seamlessly deploy their applications into Kubernetes. It's pretty awesome. It works on any infrastructure that supports Kubernetes. You can run it yourself because it's open source, and I encourage you to do pull it down. Um, we get really excited when people use it. But you're still going to need that team of certified Kubernetes administrators to run it. Even if it makes the lives of your application developers easier, it still requires quite a bit of expertise to get it up and running. Or you can run it through a vendor. There are plenty of organizations that are using it at this point. Um, you can find one, and then you can, you can use Lagoon through them. Um, I'll leave it at that, because this is what the heck is Kubernetes, not what the heck is Lagoon. That's a different session. Um, wow. That was quick. OK. This was much bigger in my mind than it turned out to be. Resources. I'll leave you with a couple handy resources. The first of which I think is really helpful is an entire YouTube playlist called Kubernetes 101 by Jeff Geerling. You might know him as Geerling Guy. It was sponsored by Amaze.io. It's pretty comprehensive. If you want to actually get into like playing around with Kubernetes yourself, maybe setting it up, this will start taking you there. Um, if you're not kind of wanting to jump that deep into the deep end, you can start with the Kubernetes docs. That's where I started. And I would recommend going to kubernetes.io slash docs slash concepts. This is the place where it will outline things, like I said, what's, what's a cluster, what are nodes, what are pods, what are all these things. And then you can gradually delve deeper as your comfort level allows. Um, and then if you want to learn more about Lagoon, we've got docs, we've got examples. I don't want to push it too hard. We've got a Discord if you want to hang out. Um, and that's it. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being my guinea pig audience. We have lots of time for you to ask me questions that I don't know if I can answer. Would you do your best to repeat them when you, like, to some extent? Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thank yeah. Thank you. Do you have any experience setting up and running Kubernetes under load on a Raspberry Pi cluster? And if so, <laughs> do you have any lessons learned that you'd like to share? I don't. I have not set up Kubernetes myself. But I have a friend over yeah. here <laughs> who I can volunteer as a sacrifice if you if you want to reply. What can you define on the load? Uh, well, in a real world application where it's not just say, sitting on a desk, oh. just, you know, where it's actually doing something that acts as the cluster. It's like any other computer at that point. It's just not very powerful. Mm -hmm. So which, uh, which pies did you try it with? I think we had Raspberry 3 and 4s. So you haven't tried using, like, say, a 4 for your control or for your masters and then a 5 for the workers, something you like could, that? You could. You could. It's just like in a real-world example, a Raspberry Pi is more like for testing. It's great. Yeah. But for an actual production environment. I know there's some things. pretty cool stuff going on with Pi's now. Yes. It isn't just testing. Like <laughs> the stuff that we host, the right, Pi's are not powerful. Of course, yeah. It is. Yes. Okay, thanks. Or do you have any lessons learned? So the hardest thing with Raspberry Pi is, is that it's all based on ARM, yeah. and everything else in the cloud, uh, still today, is a lot of um, AMD and Intel processes. So like, you need to compile everything on ARM-based, and right. that's sometimes very hard to find. Like, for example, all the PHP modules and all that stuff for ARM. That's usually the hardest part. But it becomes better as actually more and more in, in the cloud also is ARM wins. But it got to be too easy. <laughs> yes. W would you say that like on prem uh, Kubernetes is being leveraged with on prem resources, not CSPs, not not Amazon, GCP or anything like that? Is that scalable? Like I mean if we're thinking something that's not using a CSP. Even though we can we can add things to the add add um uh you can add certain things to the server, you know, um, or capacity to it. At that point, like, say, if we're speaking to a customer, we want to go to the cloud. Yes. In that in that state, in like a legacy state, we're not scalable, really, right? Would you Would you say that as if we were when we do get to the cloud and we can just? So one of the cool things about Kubernetes is that let's say you have ten servers, mm -hmm. you can still tell. Kubernetes to, for example, automatically scale across these 10 servers. And if one of them, the 10 servers dies, it will automatically restart the pause over on that server on these others. Mm -hmm. So Kubernetes in that time, like the auto healing systems, they still work even though if you have a fixed amount of nodes. Okay. It becomes really cool if you can like on demand add additional nodes. Yeah, like that's yeah. what you usually only get in the cloud. Okay. But Kubernetes 
just for even a fixed amount of nodes, it already helps. Okay. And one of the other cool things, for example, you can tell Kubernetes that some parts are more important than others. So if, let's say, you have a very important application and it needs more resources, and there's not more space, yeah. Kubernetes will go and throw away less important parts automatically, like let's say for, from your dev side, okay. so that the production side has more space. Has more space okay. And that you can do within the constraints, like even if you have a fixed amount of nodes. Okay, because I find myself where we have to continuously go back and add, add, add more space and keep adding this space to be able to uh, be able to host the production environment. But if we were in the, once we get to the cloud, we could be able to just spin up nodes. Yes, and, correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have any example? You know, like the basic, you know, guidelines is nothing of what you need. You can. We can set you up a sandbox. <laughs> For, seriously, we've got a bunch of um, repos with applications already quote unquote Lagoonized, so configured to work with Lagoon. You could spin up a vanilla Drupal really easily and put it on top of our platform. If you want, I could I could do it for you. I mean, we could do it today. Yeah, you could play around with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have put um, like a QR code or something on here so you could contact me. But if not, if you want us, if you want something to play around with. I'm happy to set it up for you. So just to see me after the session. Actually, name slide if you want. So That's true. You can find me on LinkedIn, on the interwebs. Yep. If you don't have uh, Kubernetes, how would you orchestrate containers? Like, what are some other ways to containers? Um, there are other softwares that do it. <laughs> you would do it manually. Manually, yeah. I mean, I think there was some Docker Swarm existed. I mean, still exists, but it's deprecated. That's another way you could do it. But I don't, I don't know. You would adopt adopt something that's deprecated at this point. Right now, it's like 99.999% of everything is Kubernetes based. Like it pretty much won the container administration wars, as some people called it. Okay. All the other tools all switched. Okay. So. Uh, there will definitely be something new, but we don't know yet what it is. Well, Hypervive is not a thing now. It's just so much containers now. Like, so Hypervisor will be like a VM that you can schedule VMs. Yeah, or something like Zen. Yes. Yeah. It's just the whole world moves into containers, and so every new deployment that we see are all into containers, and then they end up into Kubernetes. There is still some applications that use virtual machines. Yeah. There's actually a tool called QVirt, which allows you to schedule VMs like pods yeah. that we saw there. So then you run VMs again, but that's really only meant for legacy applications that you cannot containerize. But yeah, you see that basically Kubernetes just takes over everything in terms of containerization. And yeah, doing it manually, it works. But uh, for any production grade stuff, I would not suggest to do this manually. If you have the symbols, like a small number of containers, is that you can. Yeah, so then I would use Docker Compose. Okay. That's like what everybody uses for local development. And you can also run it on a production cost, or you can install it on a, on, a, on a server. But then you don't get any of the safe healing and the adding nodes and scheduling. And you just have one server that runs containers. So for that stuff, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Do people, I should stop prefacing things with this, but apparently I'm out of word. This feels silly, but do people use um, Kubernetes with like managed hosting kind of stuff, like Pantheon and Amphia and Amazie for that matter? I mean, Amazie, I would imagine you do, but. Um, yeah, Amazie does. Aquia is building something out that, has, yeah. that, that runs on Kubernetes. Half the customers are on Kubernetes now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Pantheon, I'm not sure. Platform, I think so. Okay. So oh, people aren't necessarily, they don't really show all their cards for everything that puts together their platform. Fair. Except yeah, for amazing. Okay. So maybe if you're on that kind of a platform, it's just kind of happening, but you're not, it's not something you're dealing with directly. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to ask them as well what's, sure. what's running and to sort of challenge them. I heard about this thing called Kubernetes and yes. how wonderfully it scales. <laughs> how does your platform stack up to that and are you using it and why not, right? Sure. Ask the hard questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with like really high traffic events that need to scale very quickly? You're a cloud provider because uh, I've run into issues where you know you have a Drupal site where it gets an onslaught of traffic very quickly. It takes time for the nodes to be provisioned and stuff. 
what strategies are there to mitigate that aside from having lots of capacity just in case? <laughs> that's a question that's honestly beyond me, and I would direct you again to Michael. <laughs> so, so we did this, fun fact, we did this with uh, the Australian government. They sent a text message to every Australian citizen, there's 20 million people that link to a website of ours. And yes, we have this. Um, so how it works is basically you let enough buffer in, in, in all different places. So you never fill the pod. Every pod can handle a specific amount of concurrent users. Yeah. You never fill that. In our case, a pod can technically handle 50 concurrent requests. Yeah. But we usually never put more than 20 on it. Yeah. So each pod has a capability. Then each node has a cap has is never completely filled. Yeah. And then the cluster always has spare nodes. Yeah. So you Absolutely. basically so because the the traffic's never go from zero to a hundred immediately. It's gonna ramp up. So first the pods are handling traffic. While that's happening, new pods are loaded. Yeah. Or started. So then at one point all the nodes are full, and then at one point all the nodes the, the, there will be new nodes. Yeah. That's so you basically have like yeah constant monitoring of all three different things. But yes, if if you really have zero to a hundred, we actually have now a couple of sites that have like a lottery website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people know at 4 p.m. like the lot, the, the the information is out. So yeah, literally nobody is at least on the website, and at 4 p.m. it's immediately there. What you can do, you can tell the cluster to preemptively scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so that only works if you know in advance correct. the traffic's coming. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But the other stuff you can like you can if you have these buffers. Yeah. It's definitely something you have to test the shit out of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Test yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, lots of capacity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, if you have a customer that's already using AWS Fargate, would you recommend them to look into Kubernetes? Like, is there a case for using Kubernetes over Fargate? I don't. I'm not familiar with Fargate. So Fargate is basically the AWS approach before Kubernetes existed. Um, AWS realized quite early that you need a container orchestrator, and they created Fargate. Now, then Kubernetes came up, everybody switched to Kubernetes, and AWS was the, uh, okay, what do we do now? So now they actually integrated Fargate into Kubernetes. So it depends a bit which version of Fargate they use, but my understanding is if you use Fargate, you actually now use Kubernetes on the line already, which is still not really see it. But the technology under it is, is, is Kubernetes. I think, Michael, I need to make you a co-presenter. <laughs> 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 cool. Uh, well, thank you.